our son realized that if I just commit a petty crime here and I'm then serving time, at least my basic needs are being met. Mark Friesen has two children now in long-term recovery. She joined me on the podcast to share her experiences about loving someone lost in addiction. We love our children and we want great things for our children. However, they surrounded themselves with, with who they think they needed in their life. And uh, it wasn't us. Mark is also the Minister of Health from 18 Nations, Saskatchewan, and is using our nation's push for self-governance to provide better mental health and addiction services for our communities here in Saskatchewan. Uh, we want to be able to build something that people can identify with, that they feel they feel like themselves uh, when they are accessing mental health and addictions. In this episode, I talked to Minister Friesen about what it was like keeping her family safe while her adult children were lost in addiction, how they found their way out, and about Métis Nation Saskatchewan's modern treaty, their upcoming Judiciary Act, restorative justice, their development of a cutting-edge healing lodge set to break ground in 2026, and how all of this will help Métis people who are addicted here in Saskatchewan and those who love them. But before we get into it, what's up? My name's Dan, podcaster, keynote speaker and advocate, and this is Hard Knocks Talks, your addictions podcast. Now, let's get into my talk with Métis Nation Saskatchewan's Minister of Health, Marg Friesen. This is Hard Knocks Talks. Hey, Marg, how are you? I'm good, thank you. Thank you for having me, Daniel. Yeah. Of course. Uh, thank you for being here. Um, is there is there anything that you'd like to say uh, before we jump in today? I would just like to say bon matin. Thank you again for having me. I think this is an interesting discussion that we'll have, and I know that it's important to you, of course, and it's also important to Métis Nation Saskatchewan and, and myself personally as well. Mm -hmm. I have some uh, personal experiences with with uh, family members uh, going through their own recovery, so I'm I'm happy to share uh, what I know and uh, what what's in store for the future for Métis Nation. Okay, well, uh, let's jump in. Uh, like you just mentioned, I understand that you have some lived experience with um, loved ones who have struggled with substance use, uh, but also with the justice system. Mm -hmm. uh, can you can you share some of those experiences with us? Yes, absolutely. So uh, we, my husband and I, my husband's name is Sandy. Uh, we realize that we love our children. We love our children. We want great things for our children. Every parent does. They want their child to succeed. Mm -hmm. um, however, when we saw that our children were involved in um, the lifestyle that they were leading at the time in their early 20s, uh, they were creating a lifestyle that they they were heavily involved in. And uh, that was the family they chose. Mm -hmm. You know, those friends and, and the people, they surrounded themselves with, with who they think they needed in their life. And uh, it wasn't us. Mm -hmm. So um, we had to create some boundaries because we had younger children at home mm -hmm. still. And we had to create some boundaries and say, hey, when you're, when you're using or when you're, when you're, well, my husband would say, when you're effed up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, don't come around. Mm -hmm. And, but we had to create these, these boundaries that we did not cross because, uh, we still had children in our care that we wanted to provide them, um, the support they needed. And hopefully they didn't go down the same road. We, we struggled with that. We struggled with, with finding balance and we struggled with, um, uh, providing support as parents mm -hmm. and we always ask them to always let us know that you're that you're okay that you're alive number one let us know you know mm -hmm. where you are and and if they if we could give get them a meal or provide some groceries we'd do that but it was support from a distance until they were yeah you know yeah I, yeah it's um it's funny and, and it gets twisted so often. Uh, boundaries are often put in place to keep people in our lives, not remove them from it. Would you agree? I agree. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I agree. Now, um, <clears throat> was the justice system involvement in their life, 
Was that a hindrance to them or did that end up actually serving their purposes when they were moving into recovery? I think it, it it's a little of both, Daniel. I think um, uh, particularly with our eldest son, his his uh, experience with the justice system was was a negative one. Mm. However, he did realize that if I just commit a petty crime here and I'm I'm uh, then serving time, at least my basic needs are being met. Three hots in a cot. That's exactly right. Yeah. And you know he was able to continue his education. He was able to have some dental work done. His medical needs were met, mm -hmm. and he was able to actually withdraw from the substances that he that that he was currently using. He does talk about it very publicly as well. He said this jail was the best thing that ever happened to me. And I'm happy to say that that both our children are now in uh, recovery and have have very fulfilling lives. And uh, uh, our son has had the opportunity to re-engage with his own children mm. and is in the process of uh, reclaiming his fatherhood and uh, having his son live with him. So we're really happy about that. Mm -hmm. And of course, our eldest daughter has been in recovery for several years. Uh, she lives a very healthy lifestyle now and has uh, two young children of her own. Her and her husband are both in recovery. So we're really happy that, of course, uh, some aspects of the the support networks that they have included in their lives has has worked for them. So having said that, um, I recently had uh, Saskatoon City Police Chief Cam McBride in the studio um, just last week, actually. And he mentioned that due to his own experiences uh, from policing downtown and, and watching people that were you know publicly intoxicated again and again and again go into the carceral system and come out clear-headed, um, whether they stayed that way or not, uh, he says that he's not opposed to coercion, to coerced treatment strategies. Um, and having said what you just said, uh, what are what are your thoughts on that? I I really have mixed feelings on on uh, um, forced treatment. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, if if in fact that person, uh, for example, gets involved with with uh, police service and they're and they're and they're picked up and they're taken to detox or uh, you know there is there has to be a better way to address that person's reason why they are on the street they're using you know who are we to decide what that person needs mm -hmm. it's the individual that needs to therefore decide what they need for themselves when they're ready mm -hmm. um, from personal experience you can't force someone into treatment mm -hmm. we can provide the the information the support networks but it's that person that has to step forward and say okay i'm ready in that regard, I can say that we can't force anyone. When the person's not ready, they're just they're just going through the mechanism. They're going through the steps. Mm -hmm. Now, do you see a difference between being incarcerated and being forced into treatment? I do. Okay. I I I think there is a fine line there. Being forced into treatment is um, people are not going to people who are forced into treatment are not going to fully invest mm. in any program. Uh, they are just um, taking the steps to get from A, B, and C and then get out of there. Mm. For me right now, it's 50-50. It's yeah. uh, I can see some, some folks may respond to, to being forced into treatment mm -hmm. because you know, when you're when you're an addict, you really don't know what's going to be good for you until you you actually are there. Mm -hmm. um, and then again, I I I really think that people need a choice. Yeah, yeah. I I think my biggest concerns around um, coercion is is who decides, right? Like if this legislation in Alberta, you know, they're they're already doing it in Alberta. It's called compassionate intervention. Mm -hmm. Um, and and if if led by the the wrong hands, could turn into nothing more than a street sweep. I agree. Yeah. I I really agree. So, um, how do you feel about uh, Pierre Polyev's promise uh, to 
reduce the availability of harm reduction resources should he be elected? Well, there's a place for harm reduction. I'm, I am in favor of harm reduction programs and services. Mm -hmm. I do believe that providing safe place for consumption actually reduces, um, uh, people, uh, being, being, uh, uh, you know, having those interventions with the justice system mm -hmm. or police services. I honestly believe if police services and the justice system worked in a healthy way with uh, harm reduction services and programs, mm -hmm. that the two would go hand in hand. I really think that people get to a place where they think um, uh, that that there's more out there for me. Mm -hmm. I, I really, I really can see myself. Um, perhaps uh uh being in a being in a place that i can contribute to society mm -hmm. uh rather than um just uh frequent fre frequently looking for you know the next the next big thing around the corner without putting the work into it yeah yeah and and quite frankly burning up tax dollars with recidivism absolutely yeah absolutely yeah. and and healthcare costs mm -hmm. yeah i i i think that um True authentic partnerships and collaboration can work hand in hand when we're addressing social economic issues. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's underpinnings, there's underlying issues why why people move towards um, having that part of their life disappear or not having to think about it or avoiding, avoiding uh, difficult parts of their life that they don't want to address. There are social impacts, there's social determinants of health mm -hmm. that that we need to examine and we need to look at positive ways examining those issues and addressing them that will uh, create a more holistic approach to supporting the individual and and supporting a healthy lifestyle and supporting healthy relationships and that that includes your relationship with your doctor your 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 counselor. your counselor your Peer like support absolutely i i honestly believe that if we worked better together as community mm -hmm. we could really solve the world's problems you know and that's that's interesting that you framed it like that because uh, chief mcbride framed it almost in the exact same way i said give us a tactile example of how the police service can work with the community organizations to to divert people from from prison from mm -hmm. the carceral system from the justice system and and he said wouldn't it be wouldn't it be amazing if when we interacted with someone uh we knew where they were from we knew their family where who, where their family was we knew where their supports were we knew the organizations that they were currently engaging with we knew where their counselor was and their doctor was wouldn't it be amazing if we could connect people with their supports that they're currently engaged with before resorting to simply throwing them in the cells absolutely yeah i couldn't agree more yeah I uh, was involved with a community-based organization several years ago that we used to have. It was a person-centered uh, approach, and we dealt with dealt with the most vulnerable people, um, people who were at the risk of being homeless or were homeless, mm -hmm. and dealt with you know the multitude of factors uh, in their lives, um, including trying to find them stable housing. Mm -hmm. And that person was involved in their own community plan, you know, and we had all the networks that they were supported by uh, attend those meetings with the individual. It worked. It was a model that worked. You need to accept the person in the space and place of where they're at in their lives at that very moment mm -hmm. um, without judgment. And you have to remove yourself as an enabler. Shift that thinking into a different paradigm by saying to yourself, what's that person's story? So having said all of that, um, how will the nation's modern treaty uh, and realization of self-governance bolster the ability to be of service to people who are struggling with, with addictions, uh, those who love them, and, um, and our province as a whole? I'm really excited uh, about uh, our road to self-government because we know we know our people. We we are the ones that should be supporting our people. We know what's working based on pilot projects we've done, i.e., in health, in education, uh, 
our our um, housing statistics with Métis Nation Saskatchewan has uh, goes without saying that that it is uh, it it's achievable and it's attainable. Mm-hmm. So sustaining um, our own health system and other systems in place, our own justice system, will be able to um, support people for future generations. Uh, we want to be able to build something that people can identify with, uh, that Métis citizens can identify with, that they feel they feel like themselves uh, when they are accessing mental health and addictions services, mm-hmm. when they're on the road to their own recovery, um, when they want to include their family in their recovery journey, when they want to buy a home for the first time. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, with, with mental health and addictions, we are, um, collaborating with the province and, uh, and the government of Canada to ensure that, you know, we have a space, we create a space so that people can access services in a, in a way that, um, doesn't diminish their identity as a Métis person, but also enhances who they are and, um, is a, and they're able to, uh, sustain, you know, their life when they're not in treatment, Mm -hmm. uh, be able to, uh, make good decisions and, uh, reconnect with family and community in a way that, that is, it is, building healthy relationships. Yeah. And, you know, um, it's, that's, that's a very good point that you touched on there as far as accessing services goes. What a barrier um, there are for many people when, uh, you know, when you, when you call central intake or, or, or whatever, uh, and, and you're faced with, with forms and, um, and, and, and all that goes along with it, you know, like a simple form. Okay. Well, we get to the place where social security number, well, holy crap, I've just spent 20 years on the street. I don't know my social security number. I don't know where to get it. I don't know where to find it. I mm-hmm. need a permanent address. I don't mm-hmm. have that. I, I need a, a health card. I don't, I don't have that. And suddenly this, this form that would maybe take 15 minutes to fill out had you had access to all the information is a six week process and people give up. Yeah. Uh, Even the simple thing is, as photo ID, you need, you, you need photo ID for, for absolutely every, every system. Yes. So uh, we have a, a service delivery uh, model. It's called Mafami, uh, connects people to people and people to places. So they navigate those huge systems. They navigate social services, possibly justice system, uh, uh, healthcare for sure, uh, to ensure that people get from, from where they're at right now and what they need and what they're asking for, uh, that we, we assist them to navigate those systems because that is a barrier. It's, it's, it's it's definitely a barrier and it's it's a killer and, and it's a killer. Exactly right. People say, oh, I, I, I don't need this. This is way too much. I can't do this. I give up. I give up. So in order, you know, to eliminate that barrier, we'll do everything that we can possibly to eliminate those barriers and, and address it in a way that still empowers the individual, Mm -hmm. but provides them the support to, to get through that. To make that forward movement. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So you mentioned, um, pushing for, uh, the nation is pushing for its own justice system. Mm -hmm. Now, does that include its own carceral system? Like I'm trying to understand and paint a picture of, of what that looks like and how it will integrate into provincial systems. Mm -hmm. So, um, it's not going to replace, um, the criminal justice system. I mean, if you've been involved with a criminal activity, uh, of a serious offense, then of course you have to go through the the colonial systems. Uh, we're hoping to collaborate with the province to ensure that the the um, restorative justice justice is considered and it's driven by community. Okay. So um, there will be community. I don't know what you want to c- call it—a community panel, a community committee, uh, which will be made up of um, individuals, um, related to the offense. And then that would take away all the, um, minor, um, conflict 
and, and, and dealing with those minor uh, injustices, I guess, uh, in a way that makes sense for for the individual mm-hmm. and uh, Métis Nation, Saskatchewan, and and the community in in which we serve. Um, so there's healing lodges coming yeah. to Saskatchewan. Exciting. Um, now let, let's let's unpack that. Mm-hmm. Now, what exactly is uh, a healing lodge? Like, what happens there? Why is it different? Are there Western modalities made available in these healing mm-hmm. lodges? Like, mm-hmm. let's really unpack that. What does that mm-hmm. look like? Mm-hmm. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Daniel, for for identifying that that's the path we're on. Mm-hmm. Uh, we are um, in the in the midst uh, final stages of of um, a healing lodge uh, accessing land and infrastructure and all that um, preliminary phase one um, that comes to developing a healing lodge. Uh, this healing lodge is going to be state of the art and it's going to um, be a collaboration of um, uh, indigenous ways of knowing and Western ways of knowing. Mm-hmm. So the clinical model and the um, the land-based model will will come together um, and connect in a way that's going to support the individual and their family. So this is a this is a 90 day model. Um, so we're moving away from the 28 day program. Yeah. It's a 90 day model initially. And then um, you know, halfway through that model, then we we connect with uh family. So, you know, the first 60 days are going to be with the individual and identifying, you know, where they're at and and what their needs are at the moment and and then having you know some some of course a programming involved on on a daily basis with that individual and then uh two thirds away through the program then will they will in, include family and so the family is involved in that recovery mm-hmm. and they recover as a family unit and they le- rebuild um relationships and learn new tools and resources on how to deal with, with um, you know, conflict resolution, for example, mm-hmm. um, a healthy parenting, and a living healthy lifestyle, learning how to cook healthy meals, you know, uh, using uh, what you've sustained Make off your the bed, land. Sweep the floor. That's exactly yes. right. Basic. Yes. Sometimes people need basic life skills, yeah. and they need oftentimes. Yes, and then they they that normalizes yeah. their their daily routine. Right. It's important, and it is very important. And then you can you can see yourself in in an environment that you've created. Uh, uh, outside the re- the the treatment facility, mm-hmm. and so then we would wrap services around that individual and their family, um, uh, using Mafami Center um, to assist the individual when needed. Uh, perhaps the individual can see themselves now. Hey, I think I want to go back to school. Mm. Uh, we would assist with that, or you know, I'm I'm going to get a job. And then maybe down the line, oh, I think I want to own a home. So, first time homeowners. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, so this is really exciting times for us yeah. because we can really see, uh, based on our own reviews and research, we can see um, those those uh, land based models that work and that we want to integrate. Uh, some pieces of that and then make it our own. And then, of course, the clinical side of things where uh, we do need to have that support as well because mm. uh, people are, uh, you know, through their treatment may may have been formally diagnosed with um with a disorder or and that they need that needs to be treated mm-hmm. and so uh we need to include um that clinical uh model into this program as well mm. i hear carson mcpherson is being consulted yeah. 
we connected with him with uh, uh, the Métis Addictions Council of Saskatchewan. So with Maxi, we connected him several <coughs> years ago when he was um, with Cedar Cobble Hill. Mm -hmm. And uh, we actually um, uh, were invited to to come to go to Cedar Cobble Hill and uh, just uh, talk about their their uh, delivery model mm -hmm. and uh, their programs and and we were we were very impressed with with um, that's that model you know what and, and I'm, I'm just picking up on this now but what a beautiful and strong undertone of reconciliation this all is isn't it absolutely and and we're um, you know in discussions with the province mm -hmm. and uh and that is at the f the forefront is is uh reconciliation yeah and uh the province has it understands that um in order for us for people to be healthy uh, who are accessing uh, addiction services in this province, they need to also be connected to who they are mm -hmm. and identify with their own cultures and values as an Indigenous person. And and on the other side of that, the nation is also recognizing that there's great value in, in Western knowledge. Absolutely. And that's, that's what I'm like, that is, that gives, that makes the hair stand up yes. on my arm a little bit. Let's take a quick break and uh, learn about today's sponsors. Okay. Sacred document from Michif. Metis Nation Saskatchewan is pursuing its own sacred document with Canada. It's what they've been fighting for since 1885, since Louis Riel died for the right to self government. It's time for Metis people to take control of their own fate, for their ancestors, for their citizens, and for the generations to come. It's our moment. It's my future. The time is now. Learn more at ourmoment.ca. Okay, today's episode is also brought to you by EHN Canada. EHN Canada is Canada's leading provider of mental health and addiction services, providing evidence-based and medically assisted care with one-year wraparound services for those suffering with substance use disorder. To learn more, find their link in the show notes below. Pine Lodge, the treatment center I went to seven years ago when I got sober, offers inpatient addictions treatment and aftercare programming in Regina, Saskatchewan. To inquire about services or make a donation, call 306 510 1891. Wellness News Choice for Healthy Living is a local resource that works to connect people to health and wellness related products, services, and expert advice from industry professionals locally allowing us to connect and engage. Check out wellnessnews.ca or skwellnesshub.ca today to learn more. To make contact or to learn more about today's sponsors, to check out our merch, or if you want to show us some love and buy us a coffee, all of those links are also in the show notes below. And we are back. <laughs> so um, when we're talking about healing lodges and we're talking about Western ways of knowing, and um, what I'm interested to know is what is the, what is the benchmark of success? for these healing lodges. Now, are we looking for abstinence or are we looking for, okay, you were using meth, now you're living a meaningful life using marijuana. We are very happy for to continue to support you in any way we can. Like, what does that look like? Just like uh, the, the other um, land-based models that we've, that we've reviewed and researched, we want, of course, have services available to individuals after they've gone through their program mm -hmm. uh, be available to them in in order for them to have the support they need to be successful so we're we want to wrap around services for two years after mm -hmm. to ensure that that person is in a you know on a healthy path and uh, they're they're getting the supports that they need or they have access to the supports that they that they need mm -hmm. and so whether that be um, you know, successfully seeking and gaining employment, uh, successfully completing an education program, whether that be a GED or a four-year degree program with university or tech institute remains to be seen. Those statistics, uh, first-time home buyers is important. Um, uh, uh, reconnection with family important. Mm -hmm. So all the data that we collect in all our um, ministries uh, that we're serving uh, individuals, 
uh, and families that will relate to the success of the healing lodge mm -hmm. for folks who have gone through the program. Yeah. And they may be gainfully employed by us. Wouldn't that be something? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was, I, I, I forget who I was talking to now. Um, I was talking to someone in the know about the, the compassionate intervention strategy that they're doing in, in Alberta. And they were, I asked them about statistics. So, and that, and that's what I was leading into when asking you about how do you, what's the benchmark of success? And um, they, they were talking about continuing to collect data on the individual as they move through their recovery so they can see where are people going when they complete, what services are they accessing? And they called it recovery capital. You know, mm -hmm. are they involved in a sports team now? Do they mm -hmm. volunteer? Are they engaging in peer support? Um, whatever. Is there is there any anything like that planned for what you're doing? Absolutely. So uh, recovery capital is a term that it, that was new to us when we first started um, talking about a healing lodge for Métis Nation, Saskatchewan. So when do you think that, your, uh, that the Nation's Judiciary Act, um, and as well, these healing lodges, when is this all going to come to fruition? When will, be, when will we be able to see these in a tactile way? We've consulted with community on the Judiciary Act. Um, that will be happening here um, in the next few months, simultaneously with, with uh, the treaty. So our moment, our self-government uh, path and journey is, is um, you know, in progress at the mm -hmm. moment. And we're going to be um, uh, having an annual general assembly of citizens in November and so that's going to be on the table to be to be um, decided on. So that's really important. The treaty is really important because that is the structure in which we are going to identify, uh, number one, who we are as a people, how you work with us as a people, how you partner and collaborate with us as a people mm -hmm. and as a government. And and you're seeing this this build of a nation in progress. You're seeing it in action. Uh, the healing lodge, of course, is really important. So the timeline on that healing lodge, Daniel, is um, we're hoping to break ground in 2026. Mm. So we're really excited about that. And then the structure, of course, will be in, in under development and um, construction phase starts and then you know i'll be really excited to see the doors open there mm -hmm. um, and uh, i think that's everything yeah. i think we touched on a lot is there anything that you would like to leave us with before we cap it i just want to thank our team i want to thank uh, uh, Lori for introducing us, Daniel, mm -hmm. and I want to thank the team, our administrative team, our our team in health, and our public service in general with Métis Nation Saskatchewan who uh, provide these opportunities, but also um, provide the the spaces and places and people that we are continuing on our journey with Métis Nation Saskatchewan, mm. um, building a nation that is going to be responsive to the people we serve. Awesome. Okay. Thanks so much, Marg. Thank you. Take care. Okay, if you got anything out of that, please hit that like button at, at the bottom of the screen. Um, if you if you if something resonated with you, please leave us a comment. If something uh, rubbed you the wrong way, leave us a comment. We want to hear it. We are all about fostering productive conversations about substance use. Uh, if you're not yet subscribed on YouTube, please hit that subscribe button. Um, we, we publish twice a week. We've got over 300 episodes for you to catch up on. We've got all kinds of content. We are on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you listen to podcasts, or right here on YouTube. That's all I got. Thanks so much. Take care, everyone. Say, this is Hard Knocks Talks. <laughs>